very shortly. Good morning, teachers and students. My name is Antonia, and I'd like to welcome I'd like to wish you a happy Work Earth Week and welcome you all to the Why Healthy Air Matters program. We are here today to celebrate the Earth and educate ourselves on how we can all take action to keep our environment sustainable. Earth Day, which has been celebrated since 1970, is defined as a day of action to change human behavior and create global, national, and local policy changes. We would like to share a short video from EarthDay.org about this year's theme, Invest in Our Planet. When we think of Earth Day, some things that come to mind are climate change, pollution, and organized group efforts such as beach cleanups. But the reason why we are all here today is to shed light on the importance of air quality. The South Coast Air Quality Management District, or South Coast AQMD for short, is the air pollution control agency for the South Coast Air Basin, which includes large areas of Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties, including the Coachella Valley. South Coast AQMD's mission is to clean the air and protect the health of all residents in our region. Today, we are here to talk about how South Coast AQMD does their part in supporting the earth year round and how we can all learn ways to do our part to protect the earth as well. Do you all know the history of Earth Day? Earth Day has been celebrated since 1970. Earth Day came about because of the large amount of pollution that was caused by insufficient automobiles. Fast forward to today, we are still celebrating Earth Day 53 years later as a day of celebration, to, as a day of action to change human behavior and create global, national, and local policy changes. Today, we have a special guest, Brad McClung, who is a program supervisor from South Coast AQMD. His presentation will teach you all about the air pollution sources and share his insight into his role at the Air Pollution Agency. Before I hand it over to Brad, I'm going to cover some housekeeping. Please be aware that the presentation is being recorded and live streamed. By participating today, you authorize recording of audio and visual content presented during the event and consent to subsequent use of the recording by South Coast AQMD. Now let's give a warm welcome to Brad McClunk. Thank you very much, Antonio, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name again is Brad McClung. I'm a program supervisor with South Coast Air Quality Management District. I've been with the district for approximately 25 years, joined in 1999. 
And I've had a variety of duties uh, in my time here, really primarily for the first 15 years of my career. I, uh, I was an inspector, part of the Office of Compliance and Enforcement. And uh, I feel the Office of Compliance and Enforcement plays a pretty vital role in uh, what we do as, a, as an agency. Uh, we can adopt all kinds of rules and we can adopt uh, uh, all kinds of programs. But if, uh, if we don't have people out there enforcing those rules, well, uh, the rules are only as good as the enforcement as we uh, unfortunately see in, in, in many times in society today. Um, we also deal with a lot of public complaints, so we get to deal with uh, with everyone who is impacted by the air quality and interact with the uh, with the public. And personally, uh, I studied engineering when I was uh, in college, and just really felt a calling on my life that I needed to get into environmental stuff. I grew up uh, at a time when pollution was uh, really horrible. And uh, by the mid 80s, uh, I was really uh, more gearing my life towards following an environmental health career. And as an inspector, it's been really an honor and a pleasure to, um, to be involved in some very big cases, some, some really, um, some really, you know, multi-million dollar settlements, uh, lots of pollution causing uh, uh, areas, and to be a part not only to get those penalties, but more along the lines of cleaning up the air um, has really, you know, really brought me uh, quite a bit of, of pleasure. So next slide, please. So where does South Coast Air Quality Management District come in? Well, our mission is to protect you, to protect the health of the citizens, to clean the air. And we do that through a variety of, uh, of of programs. Um, we regulate businesses, anything from the refinery to the power plant where all of our power is generated from, to even down to the smallest of sources, believe it or not, your dry cleaner where you take your clothes to get uh, cleaned, uh, that is also regulated. So from the smallest of sources all the way down, all the way up to the biggest of sources, um, most of these facilities will obtain a permit from our agency. So we have a whole engineering and permitting team that takes care of permitting, uh, public engagement, things like this, uh, dealing with public complaints, uh, holding meetings, uh, having a public open public process when any rules are being adopted. Um, that's all part of our public engagement to make sure that the citizens are aware of what we do. Uh, we have a whole science and technology department that takes care of uh, really studying the air, taking samples. Uh, you can get immediate uh, air quality uh, readings from wherever you live so that you know what the air quality is in like your neighborhood. And, uh, and research, development, demonstration, huge part of our organization. We're always trying to advance the latest technologies, the cleanest technologies. So we're really, really multifaceted in, in regulation, public engagement, all the way to really researching and trying to figure out better ways to clean up the air and keep it clean. Next slide, please. Why do we do this? Why do we do this in South Coast? Why, uh, why is it so important in our neighborhoods? Well, we suffer from some of the worst air quality and probably definitely in the nation, sometimes even in the world. This is a, a, a unique topography in Southern California. We're surrounded by mountains. Uh, we get this, get this sort of inversion layer that just kind of keeps the pollution at ground level. And it, it, it's really, really, really tough in Southern California. Uh, we have 17 million residents, 12 million vehicles, uh, two of the biggest ports in the world. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot of sources of pollution in this area. And the unique topography just makes it even more challenging to keep the air clean. Next slide. 
Well, air quality is important for a lot of reasons, but not not the least of which is the impact on our health. Um, it, it, it can definitely cause respiratory diseases. Asthma is very common. I have a nephew who's got asthma. Uh, my, my sister has COPD. And pollution, whether it causes it, it certainly affects it. And, uh, and cardiovascular disease, cancer, premature deaths, they've all been contributed to air pollution. And it is really important that, uh, that we take this very seriously and we do everything we can as an agency to reduce air pollution. And uh, that's, uh, you know, being here for 25 years, it, it's really been uh, an honor and a privilege to be a part of that task, to be a part of that mission. And I certainly know being 56 years old, that while it isn't perfect, we've, we've made great strides. And I really do believe we're going to continue to make those strides to where we're going to we're going to be surprised how clean the air can be with this many people living here. Next slide, please. So what are the sources of pollution? Well, there's all, all kinds of sources. Uh, uh, certainly there's natural sources. I mean, uh, uh, we, we have wildfires and that contributes. Uh, there is uh, uh, definitely uh, pine trees can emit pollution. Uh, so there's lots of different areas of natural air pollution that are simply not controllable by an agency like us. But there are many areas where we can control the pollution and that is uh, area-wide sources, uh, whether it be livestock or fertilizer, how this, this slide is kind of showing you these areas. But area-wide sources can also be the house paints that you, that you use. The uh, products that you use around your house uh, can certainly emit. And we, we would consider those area-wide sources because they don't come from one particular point. House paint is used throughout the basin. But if you accumulate or calculate how many gallons of paint are sold in our area, you could just imagine how much pollution comes from just the sale of house paint. Go into a Home Depot or a Lowe's or a hardware store, what is the primary, primary uh, sales item that you see when you walk through the door? Generally, it's the paints, and they are a huge contributor to pollution, believe it or not. Um, and then more along the lines of what we really concentrate on is stationary sources, all of the power plants, the sewage treatment plants, the refineries, all the way down to an auto body shop that sprays paint to the factories that burn a lot of natural gas to bake our bread or to produce the goods that we use. And the primary and the one of the biggest sources with 12 million vehicles on the road and all the trucks and buses and motorcycles and everything else from the ports uh, are mobile sources, huge, huge source of pollution. And uh, we do our part as well to try, try to reduce the pollution coming from mobile sources. Next slide. So what can you do to help clean the air? Well, certainly we have to we have to be aware of our choices when it comes to transportation. Uh, obviously, we all know vehicles are a big source of air pollution. Uh, the federal government, the state government, our local agencies are doing our part, doing the best that we can to get us to transition to electric vehicles but that transition is gonna take some time. So whenever you can walk, whenever you can bike, whenever you can carpool to reduce the number of vehicles that are on the road, whenever you can take public transportation, these things are really, really primary things we can do to try and reduce the pollution from mobile sources. Recycling, reusing things, reducing our use of things, trying to reduce our carbon footprint is that term and that phrase has come so common anymore is definitely something that uh, that we can do. Being of the older generation and being 56, recycling was not on the forefront of our minds when I was growing up. Uh, but as I've gotten older, we have a huge container uh, that we use to recycle. This is something we didn't do when I was a kid. So recycling is really, really important to reducing our carbon footprint. You can stay informed and get involved. We have all kinds of 
activities. We have all kinds of programs that can help you get involved in just in our agency or just making yourself aware of air pollution. Uh, we have an app for your, for your cell phone. You can download our app. Again, you punch in your zip code or your address, and it's going to give you instantaneous readings of what the, what the air quality is like in your neighborhood. Uh, sign up for these programs like WAM, anything like that, just to stay informed and get involved. The public being involved in this process is really, really important. And uh, these are tools that you can use to stay informed and to maybe one day get involved in this uh, as a career. Um, another thing is if you ever see a smoking vehicle, uh, definitely if you can safely get that license plate off of that vehicle, you can call our agency at 1-800-CUT-SMOG and you can let us know just the license plate number and where you saw the vehicle. You could do it anonymously and our agency will take the time to send the registered owner of that vehicle a letter letting them know somebody spotted their vehicle smoking. And maybe that will be enough to get that person to go, uh oh, I might get in trouble. And they'll fix their vehicle instead of driving around a smoking vehicle. And other areas, planting trees, becoming involved in events where you're uh, trying to do anything you can to help clean up the air. Um, certainly, planting trees and cleaning up is definitely helpful in just cleaning up the air. Next slide, please. Saving energy. There's another thing, saving energy. My wife and I, we switched our house to much more energy efficient appliances, much more energy efficient light bulbs, uh, and was able to reduce our electric bill and our gas consumption tremendously by, by doing so. So you could definitely, uh, you could definitely do that transition. Uh, turning off the light when you leave a room is certainly uh, helpful. I'm the worst at that. And I'm getting better because I realize it impacts my electric bill, but more along the lines, it impacts pollution because it's wasted energy that has to be produced somewhere. And still in this in this city, primarily, we're still using natural gas and power plants to produce that electricity. Um, shop locally, stay local. Uh, just be conscious of what you're doing when you are out and about. Are you wasting energy? Are you wasting trips? These are things that can really, really help. And uh, I can't tell you enough. Consider a, a, a career in science, in environmental or public policy. Uh, I studied industrial hygiene when I was in school. I grew up in the 70s. The pollution was horrible. We used to go outside at recess and lunch and be sent back inside because we had a second stage smog alert. I would exercise with my friends out. Uh, we'd run around in the street. We'd play flag football, whatever it was. Get home, my chest killed. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. And I'm really pleased and, and, and really happy to be in a career that, is, that has helped make that happen. Um, so definitely, if this is something that you're excited about, something that you feel a calling to do, I can't emphasize enough, follow that calling and get involved in, in making a difference and choosing environmentally friendly products. You know, one of my primary jobs when I was uh, first as an inspector is um, making sure that the products and the, uh, the chemicals that you use just to clean at your house or to paint your house were all low VOC products. We regulate those products. And I would go out and make sure what you can purchase is the lowest, but there are zero VOC products. There are labels on products that let you know that they're low polluting or that they're environmentally fr friendly. So you definitely have to keep an eye on what you're buying and what you're using just for common cleaning products and common everyday tasks. And, you know, Wood fire burning, wood fire fireplace, wood burning fireplaces are becoming a thing of the past, um, but people still do that. Is it always necessary to burn wood? Is it always necessary to have a fire? We all like to have fun. I'm not trying to be a killjoy, but you just have to be aware of that. And you just have to be aware, is that really necessary? 
Um, so keep a mind, keep your mind on that as well. Next slide. And that's pretty much my presentation. I hope I, I uh, excited some people and I hope I educated some, but I, I'm here to answer any questions about what I do. Uh, I'm, I'm here to answer any questions about what, uh, what our agency does. So if, if anyone has any questions, please, uh, I'm happy to, happy to answer them. Yes, thank you so much, Brad, for that insightful presentation. We will now open the floor to allow students and teachers to ask any questions you might have about the presentation. I'll give you a few minutes to type in. Okay, I think we have one question so far. How did you first become interested in environmental issues and what made you pursue this career? Well, as I stated a little bit earlier, I grew up in the 70s when pollution was really bad. Uh, cars were not efficient. Uh, appliances were not efficient. And I played sports when I was younger. I played sports from seven years old until high school. And uh, during most of that time, any outdoor activities and any, any real physical exertion would generally result in me going home with a chest that was pretty sore. And I knew it was impacting my health. I didn't need to be told that. Obviously, my chest hurt. So as I was leaving high school and getting into college, I thought, I'm going to go into the engineering field, but I just really felt the calling to go into the environmental field. And uh, I had some friends that worked at local refineries and they were doing their part to clean up the refineries. And you can imagine how dirty they were in the eighties. Um, and it just felt the real calling. So that's, uh, that's primarily why I went into the field. Um, I didn't necessarily think I'd end up at the AQMD but I'll tell you, I sure glad I am. Amazing. Thank you for that answer. Just a reminder, um, if anyone has any questions, we have uh, the Q&A chat box that you can submit your questions to. We have another one. What type of change have you seen thanks to the work you've done and the improvements that have been happening? Well, I can tell you that even in the time that I've been here for 25 years, our air quality has improved substantially since 1999. And I feel that I've played a part in that. Um, I can say that uh, when I first started at the agency, house paints that you used to buy were a lot higher in VOC than they are today. Now, no, everyone's probably wondering, what is VOC? What does that mean? VOC is volatile organic compounds. They're carbon containing compounds. And VOC is like gasoline. Gasoline is 100% VOC. You put that on the ground, it's going to evaporate into the air. And VOC combined with the oxides of nitrogen are your tailpipe emissions or anytime you burn natural gas would release NOx. VOC and oxides of nitrogen combine with one another to make even more smog. And I have been able to watch and be a part of seeing uh, paints, whether you're painting cars, whether you're painting metal parts, or whether you're painting the walls in your house. I've seen a lot of these products, if not a majority of these products, go from an oil base, heavy VOC product, to many times now we're using water-based products, doing as good a job as they did before, and reducing the emissions tremendously, tremendously. Believe it or not, there's 10 million gallons or more house paint sold in the South Coast Basin every year. Think about that. You go buy a gallon, it's 10 million of those being sold in a year. It's really quite staggering. And so I've been a big part in enforcing and uh, making sure that businesses and the products that we can buy at our uh, at our local hardware stores are much more environmentally friendly. Thank you for that answer. We have another one. What exactly do you look for and inspect when you walk through factories and power plants? That's great. Now, our agency adopts a series of regulations, and we have many of them. 
And most point sources, whether it be an auto body shop or a big factory, let's say Boeing or the refineries, um, they're all going to have to comply with certain regulations. They're going to have to use certain products. They're going to have to have certain burners in any of their any of their equipment that would burn natural gas. They're going to have to have low NOx burners. They're going to have to do whatever they can and whatever our regulations tell them to do to reduce their pollution. So as an inspector, we're going in there, we're enforcing these regulations, we're looking at all of their equipment, we're making sure it's all properly permitted, we're making sure it's all properly run, we're making sure that they're complying with our rules and regulations. And if they do not comply with our rules and regulations, they could very well get a notice of violation. They'll get a ticket. And that will most likely, either they will have to correct their issues and pay some sort of a penalty, or in worst case scenarios, they may have to completely revamp their factory, put in new equipment, because their current equipment doesn't comply with the rules. So that's primarily what we do as an inspector. Okay, thank you so much for that answer. We have another question. You mentioned choosing environmentally safer cleaning products. How do you make sure if the product is safe to use or not? Well, that's a great question. And sometimes you can never know. You know, you really don't know. Um, but I think one thing that you can look is for labels. Uh, these companies, believe it or not, are regulated by the labeling that they put on products. So they're not allowed to mislead us and have a high polluting product and then put on the label that it's not or that it's environmentally friendly. So definitely paying attention to the labels, definitely looking at the chemicals that may be used in the product. But I think it, at the end of the day, the best thing that you can do is really search for low polluting products, environmentally friendly products, low VOC. Now that maybe you know a little bit more about what VOC means, when you look at paints, when you look at products, if you see something that says low VOC or low NOx or low, those are keywords to let you know that, uh, that it is at least more environmentally friendly. Okay, and I think we have time for just one more question. Do you think that future technological advances will benefit the elimination of air pollutants? Uh, absolutely. I mean, there's just no, there's no doubt. Uh, there's always a trade-off. There's always a trade-off, but there's no doubt that the more that this state, the more that the country and Hopefully, eventually, the rest of the world makes a transition away from a petrochemical energy system and starts to transition more and more to renewable energy, energy that doesn't create pollution. Uh, there's just no doubt that we're going to see improvements as this local community in South Coast gradually makes that transition to cleaner burning cars, electric vehicles, there is simply no doubt that we're going to be able to wake up and have those days where we're like, wow, I never used to see those mountains year round. And now I do. So I have no doubt that we're on the right path. It's a challenge. Every day is a challenge. It's a, cha it's, it's a challenging career, but it's fulfilling. And I really do believe that uh, technology and human ingenuity and let's face it, you need government regulation. You, you've got to have it. You've got to, you've got to have technology forcing uh, regulations at time to make this transition possible. But I have no doubt that you're going to grow up in a cleaner environment. Your children are going to grow up in a cleaner environment. And I think um, it doesn't always have to be doom and gloom. I think we're on the right path and we're definitely going to see a cleaner environment in the future. Amazing. Glad we got to end on a positive note here. Thank you so much for celebrating Earth Week with us today. Don't forget tomorrow is Earth Day and we hope you take the opportunity to do something to benefit our Earth this weekend.
just as a reminder, we had a lot of really great questions. And if we didn't have the um, opportunity to answer all of your questions, please feel free to email and we will get back to you with your answers. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure.